out of all the years I've been doing YouTube, 2022 was probably my least productive year out of all of them. And there are plenty of reasons why. And I felt that if nothing else, I should probably do a video that wasn't originally going to be put out, just something for myself, where I go off on an incoherent tangent about some of the things that have been pissing me off in regards to movie making and a tiny bit about my own personal life. Not a ton because some of it's very private, but in any case, I wrote down some questions for myself as I was recording them and then answered them to the best of my ability, which as you're about to find out, isn't that great. And I figured, you know what, put it up as a vlog entry, maybe do it at least once a week in order to say that you're making a video once a week, be more productive, be more open with yourself to the world. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, here is my original tangent on 2022. I never really know how to start off a video, even when I have an intro right in my mind, because whenever I initially think that I'm going to stick to the script that I had originally written out, all of a sudden I want to add on to it and try and improv a little bit, and then all of a sudden the original thoughts that I have had in my mind sometimes have been in my mind for absolute days. They just all of a sudden blank on me right at the worst possible time. And I know there are a lot of people saying, well, why don't you just edit it out? YouTubers do that all the time. And I have gotten really sick of seeing that format where there's always a jump cut in between noticeable times when people froze up, forgot their lines, or just have run out of things to say so they're going to look up back on their notes. I like to do things as clear and concise in one take as I possibly can. And there are so many times where coworkers, friends and family have gone up and said, you were so, you were so fast and fluid. You knew exactly what you were going to say. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's because that was maybe the fourth or fifth time that I tried to nail it in exactly one take. A part of me thinks I'm being a little bit too much of a perfectionist when it comes to trying to nail everything in one take. But at the same time, it saves me a lot of time in the editing room where I only have to get photos and in some rare occasion for a video essay, actual video clips where that's really the only thing I have to splice together. And on top of that, it's just much less stressful to do it in one take and get it over with without having to worry about memorizing everything, without having to worry about everyone else in the house who might be making a noise, and just the sooner you get this video over with, the better, which may sound like a really stupid thing for a YouTuber to say, because for a movie reviewer like myself especially, you hear it so often in channel trailers or just interviews with each other about how people just love movies to death so much that they go on and on about it in real life to the point where they just created the channel so that they can get their thoughts across in a more natural way so they wouldn't have to piss everybody off. And I did that a hell of a lot when I was a kid and a young adult. And there's this urge for me to do so a hell of a lot more as an adult. Like I'm constantly waiting for the people in my life to ask, hey, have you seen this? What did you think about it? And then I'll be a s presumably ready to say something. And then sometimes I just cut to the chase and make it short because I'm always thinking about what the people in my life want to hear compared to in my videos where it's really whatever I want to hear and nothing else. Kind of like uh, Hollywood writers these days, the more I think about it. That just started off by accident. It started off during the original lockdown where, um, honestly, I mean, it goes without saying, people had so much free time on their hands. And normally when I was doing my first Disney binge, the videos were about as long as any other ones. The ones that went past the five minute mark were the movies I loved or hated the most, whether it be Hunchback of Notre Dame or Black Cauldron. And then over time, as more movies became available, whether they were on streaming or the dozens of times movie theaters reopened and closed, I think I was just so 
excited to see a brand new movie again that I felt like I needed to go on and on about the stuff I liked or didn't like. Not to mention, the more reviews I'd seen from other people, there were key components that I thought were crucial to explaining what was good or bad about a movie without getting into spoilers that I felt could have been at least addressed in other videos, if not my own content. And some of my biggest inspirations when making movie reviews actually come from video essayists who analyze more than review stuff. People like Every Frame of Painting or Royal Ocean Film Society, where they talk very specifically about the format of filmmaking or the structure of a story. And there's that monologue Michael Keaton has in Birdman where he confronts the critic, where he points out that there's nothing about the craft itself, the technicality and the quality of it, really just what people wanted it to be versus how it ended up being. And that's something I try my best to avoid at all costs. I kept saying to myself over and over again as I was getting writer's block, video block, whatever artist block you want to call it, Originally, I just made the excuse that everybody else did where the world was reopened again and all of a sudden I had to go back to work and only had two days off to see a movie. So I just kept saying, you know, I don't have as much time as I used to. And at first that kind of was a legit reason. But from last year until now, especially, a lot of it has really come down to the fact that movies just aren't as entertaining as they used to be. And it's so hard for me to actually come up with notes on the fly after seeing a movie for the very first time. It takes me a lot longer to write notes for it. I fuck up a hell of a lot more when I'm reciting the lines that I have. And I had a very meticulous process where I would actually read out my entire review with the camera not on but with the screen on so that i could at least look at myself and then look back at the screen and supposedly feel a hell of a lot more comfortable but if i'm being honest that might have made me a little more dependent on the written word even though it is technically important for people to know how to write in order to be better public speakers i mean jordan peterson goes on and on about how it's important to teach people to write so that they know how to think and then at the same time, he tells other people in interviews how he comes up with the process of his stage lectures. And then you find out, dude's actually just coming up with whatever thoughts in his head that are relevant to the subject he's discussing on the fly. And I just sat there and I went, that seems really counterintuitive. But at the same time, dude is one hell of a writer. And if he's able to come up with so many specific examples about how to help people become more responsible and more willing to go out in the world and accomplish something, which is a feeling I've tried for months, maybe even a year listening to his stuff. I just got his ebook and as I was, no joke, cleaning my room for the first time in God knows how long, I realized I wasn't really paying that close of attention. It felt like music in the background to kind of motivate me to do what he wants people to do. And I can't really tell if that's a good thing or not, whether I'm actually paying attention, whether I can actually understand how um, meticulous his... Not meticulous, how articulate his vocabulary is. And also whether or not I'm actually listening to him for the things that I agree with him specifically on, or if I'm actually willing to take him up on that idea to strain away from ideology, just look at the world objectively, and if it goes against what other people are saying, so be it, at least it's the truth. That really had nothing to do with the question that I had asked, but... Um, one thing Dr. Peterson and I agree upon is that the world has gotten increasingly more obsessed with this need to be perfect, as tolerant and compassionate towards everyone, except for those you disagree with, because that's the one thing I've never understood about political correctness and the ideology of being woke, I guess. I hate saying the word woke in my videos, and unless I said it in Glass Onion, I don't think I ever have on my channel. I've done it on Josh's channel a couple times just because 
we were going off the cuff, and that was the main reason... That's one of the main reasons I like doing videos with Josh, is that I do have notes on hand, but I try to make it a goal or a responsibility to at least remember all of that and then improv everything else off the cuff in order to... Just in order to be a better thinker, because Josh is generally so good at it, and a part of that is because he's a much more passionate man towards film and filmmaking than I am, and he has more hands-on experience. Is anything I'm saying really have anything to do with the question? Sorry, I'll just ask myself the question again. Well, one reason is I keep telling myself that because I'm working longer hours at my job, and it's a full-time, not salary, but uh, well-paying enough job at a restaurant, so... And I cater to exclusive clientele who are very... I want to say choosy, but unfortunately a lot of them have the choice over how long we really stay at the restaurant for, because it involves some sports and some very special events, and then there are board of directors and such, and a part of me genuinely thinks a lot of our customers can be incredibly ungrateful and spoiled towards how long they stay, and also they need jobs in order to stay rich, so a part of me wonders what exactly these people do for a living. I know a lot of co-workers my age feel as if they've inherited stuff, and no doubt some of them have, but I'm much more optimistic, and I know for a fact that it takes a lot of hard work in order to get rich in the first place and stay rich, something that, again, a lot of co-workers my age can't really fathom, because they see so many people online or on TV who have gotten rich in an incredibly easy way and have stayed rich despite the fact that they're fucking idiots. Such is life, but... At first I thought, because of the longer hours and the fact that I, again, only have two days, I feel like I should spend most of that time relaxing, and part of that relaxing is just watching a movie and enjoying it, but there are so many days where I just sit at my computer watching the same videos over and over again, thinking that it'll give me a different approach, and, well, that's the definition of insanity, and a part of me thinks that if the movies that I've been watching lately were as good as they could have been, I'd be right here at my laptop coming up with so many notes, or just thinking of stuff off the cuff. I mean, in 2017 and 2018, I think I did quite a few videos where I didn't have a script. I was just coming up with as many examples as I could because I had them, because the movies being made were considerably higher in quality and entertainment value compared to the shit that we've got nowadays. And I was going to make a video about why 2022, in my opinion, sucked for movies. I had thousands of words written in my therapeutic review format where the therapist would ask me why do you think that is and I had five very specific examples it's the lack of originality in scripts and filmmaking in terms of scripts I mean there were so many sequels so many adaptations and reboots where it's not that the stories being retold were bad it's just so many of them had formulas that you were so used to seeing that you knew for a fact whether or not you were going to enjoy them. And that's not... One of the great things about going to a movie is being able to be surprised by something that you feel as if you know how it's going to be. But there's stuff like Jurassic World where you know exactly where that's going to go. You have Marvel Cinematic Universe, which as much as I still enjoy some of their stuff... I already know the formula behind it. I know there's going to be a lot of quippy humor. I know that at the very end of the day, the heroes are going to come out on top until, like, the first mashup of a superhero team-up when the overarching villain does show up, and there are going to be minor, if any, consequences whatsoever. Formulas like that, they're not unique anymore. And the filmmaking has gotten incredibly standard to the point where I have trouble just coming up with the most minute details. Everybody said that Glass Onion was a well-directed movie. It wasn't. It was the editing and the structure of the story in Johnson's writing. That was, like, the closest thing to being original. Beyond that, it's just a lot of standard shot, reverse shot. There's one scene where they do split scenes for people on the phone, which I haven't seen anyone do in, like, God knows how long, but they don't capitalize on that because... The movie is against capitalizing, and that's another thing. For an original franchise now with Glass Onion, it already has its own formula, and I talked about it in more depth in my 
video just to point out that, yeah, you can come up with an original franchise and it can still be cliched generic as hell. And formulas themselves aren't even really that bad. I mean, Mad Max has its own formula, Jason Bourne has its own formula, but those formulas are fresh and original compared to the formulas that you see from Disney, from 20th Century Fox, from Warner Brothers. I'm sure some of those properties belong to them anyways, but you get what I mean when I say that. So, unoriginal stories, unoriginal filmmaking, unfucking believably desperate comedy. I mean, Jackass Forever was like the one comedy that I could say from start to finish was hilarious. And that's mostly because these people know for a fact what they're doing is fucking stupid, but they're brave enough in order to do shit for real. I don't know why I brought that up. There are so many comedies that rely on people standing around improv And you know for a fact that they're improv because half of what they, sh what they say is not funny whatsoever. There's no indication of a beginning, middle, or an end in a scene, which is a huge problem when you're improv in movies. And that's why people have gotten sick of Judd Apatow stuff, because it's incredibly clear that as fun as it might have been on set, you still need to come up with a structure in order to make the comedy work. That's what made Whose Line Is It Anyway funny. There were specific rules on how a scene could go. You have Hollywood director where every actor hits their mark, then Colin comes up, and they repeat that over and over again with all the scenes that they have, and once they run out of scenes, the scene's over. I'm starting to realize why I write my own script because as you can tell I'm pretty incoherent just going off the cuff which you realize a lot of really good writers are really bad at that kind of stuff. Quentin Tarantino writes amazing scripts but when he's talking off the cuff he kind of sucks at it I mean the Bruce Lee shit that he talked about he gave such terrible examples and honestly I could defend his Bruce Lee shit in Once Upon a Time within a matter of seconds. Literally the first line of dialogue Bruce Lee says is, now I admire Cassius Clay, I really do. When he says that he would cripple Cassius Clay, it's off screen, you don't see his face, so you have absolutely no idea whether he genuinely means it or if he's bluffing in order to look tough. And an Asian guy in the 60s where nobody would take him seriously, chances are he would have to bluff and make himself out to be a bigger threat in order for people to take him seriously. Not to mention, the movie does actually show off the great work that he passed on to other actors in his training montage with Sharon Tate and with her other friends like Jay Sebring because he was actually a trainer to these actors. And for anyone who's asking, well, those scenes weren't treated on the same level. Yes, they were. They were just with little dialogue whatsoever where the visuals showed what a talented martial artist he was, what a great teacher he was, and how grateful his students were. Tarantino seriously couldn't co come up with that? I did say that there were five examples. Free was ungodly unfunny comedy, but enough about 4, Love, and Thunder where you have the screaming goats, you have the... You have four and the one kid arguing over what his name is, which, does that mean what I think it means? I'm pretty sure it does. You have Korg in there for absolutely no reason. I went on and on about it for like 20 minutes why it wasn't funny, so you could just take what you will of that. But I think the biggest reason is because movies are so obsessed with having to reflect modern sensibilities. Not necessarily modern day, but modern sensibilities. And as a result, movies have gotten so cynical that because they're portraying messages that supposedly apply to real life, that they have to be realistic about it, not hopeful. It just fucking sucks to watch. I mean, Armageddon time, I knew for a fact was going to be preachy as hell and incredibly one-sided about the messages regarding race and class inequality, but I still went and gave it a chance because of Anthony Hopkins' supporting performance. And while it's by no means one of his best, it was definitely one of his more sympathetic and humble because when I saw him in the trailer, how supportive he was while also reflecting about the pain and suffering that he went through as a Jew before coming over to North America, it reminded me a lot of my grandpa because he went through the exact same 
circum not the exact same circumstances. He was Polish. Uh, Hopkins' character, his family anyway, wasn't. And he came to Canada as opposed to America. But he still had that exact same mentality of being as optimistic and supportive towards his grandchildren and, of course, his children as possible in order to make sure they have a positive outlook and to, in order to overcome the human suffering. Themes that this movie does not regard or hold dear to it whatsoever because it goes on and on about how the American dream is supposedly a fraud and people are taken advantage of because of individualism, because of capitalism, even though the kids in this movie are assholes. Yes, they do go through some serious shit. The teacher treats both of them like garbage because, well... The, the main kid, I have absolutely no idea why he started picking on him. It's not because he's Jewish. I guess it's because he wanted to be an artist as opposed to actually paying attention to reading and writing, which, okay, I understand why you're upset, but yeah, the teacher was unnecessarily a dick to him. And it was incredibly obvious why the teacher was mean towards the black kid, but the black kid's responses to being bullied by the teacher is by cursing him out in front of everybody, which... I get that you're angry and the bullying from the teacher is unjustified, but you don't fight back with the exact same tactics as a bully. It's like in Glass Onion where everybody decides they're going to lie their ass off on the stand in order to put Edward Norton away in jail. Yeah, he was guilty of all these things, but lying about it in court, you know, committing a crime to put away someone for committing a crime... It makes absolutely no fucking sense. And as much as the movie wants to make it out as if the system is ruining these kids' lives, they're ruining their lives for themselves. I mean, on a field trip, they ditch it and run off in the streets in the middle of New York for the rest of the day and never go back to school. Their idea of fulfilling the American dream is by stealing computers and selling them so that they can run away. That's not the American dream. The American dream is individuals being given the opportunity and working their ass off legitimately. That's how you do it. I'm Canadian, and even I fucking understand that. And the fact that in the movie, the Trumps, I don't know, trumpet this message, and you're supposed to look at them awful because they're hypocrites, and yeah, they are hypocrites, but what they're saying is legit. They don't take their own advice. I'm well aware of that, and I hate the Trumps as much as anyone else does. Go back and watch my earlier videos. I make as many jokes as I possibly can. Jokes I probably shouldn't have done, but mostly because they had nothing to do with the movie, but yeah, I agree with the politics. I don't agree with the presentation of the movie. And that's... That's what pisses me off so much about modern entertainment these days. It feels as if it's obligatory for you to agree with the politics of the writer, the director, the cast and crew when they're doing interviews. They make it explicitly clear that there was a political motivation behind their performance or the characterization. And I just sat there, I'm like, okay, for a superhero movie, I want to see people punching, kicking, and using badass superpowers. It doesn't matter if it's a man, it's a woman, or anything else in between. I just want to see them do something badass. I don't need the man to be physically and intellectually and emotionally weaker than the woman. I don't need the woman to be this blank slate who is never happy with anything and keeps going on and on about how hard it is for her, even though she can literally kick anyone else's ass in the entire movie. So clearly, you have nothing to complain about in comparison. These movies are doing exactly what they claim to, but they seriously think that you're too fucking stupid to acknowledge that. I'm only taking off my shirt to give this very specific example. These two characters right here, Webby and Lena, I haven't showed this well, in good quality anyways, on camera, but at uh, TIFF of 2022, I got these before the festival ended because these are two of, if not the two best characters that I've had the pleasure of experiencing in my lifetime. And it's not because they're incredibly badass, although that part definitely helps. I mean, 
Webby is a martial arts expert, and Lena is maybe an invincible sorceress. I don't know. Some of her powers are so insane, you wonder why they don't put... You think that the main reason they don't put her in more episodes is because she can end just about everything. I mean, that's why Beakley and Violet, for that matter, aren't really in the show. But I don't like them because they're on the same level, if not greater, than the men in the story. I like them because they have stories that anyone of any gender, any background in general, can understand. I mean, Lena comes from a broken home, and Webby has been sheltered by her grandmother. Well, for starters, the two of them are only children raised by one parent, and that parent shelters them from society in general for various different reasons. For Beakley's case, the reason she shelters Webby is because she's genuinely afraid that something bad is going to happen to her, which is why she taught her all of her spy skills ranging from martial arts, God knows how many languages, so much knowledge that most adults couldn't really understand so that when she inevitably does pass on, Webby will ha supposedly have everything she needs in order to survive. But that comes at the price of not having good social skills, not being able to interact with other kids her age, because it was really just, it was really just these three growing up, so that when she does finally get introduced to kids that are her age, she has absolutely no idea how to act, how to behave, how to get by, but she's very fortunate in the fact that the boys in question are extremely patient, and they understand the feeling of being sheltered, because they've been through the exact same thing, so as fearful and angry as they can occasionally be, they know for a fact that it takes small steps. And that process of them being so caring and understanding is something that she passes on to Lena, who was sheltered for a completely different reason. Her mother, aunt... She's basically her mother. I don't know why they kept calling her aunt, other than they hate to admit that it's that kind of relationship, even though it is. Magica is just so selfish and manipulative and really only sees... She really only sees Lena as a servant who can carry out her evil deeds. And Lena has gotten incredibly resentful towards that, but also very self-loathing because it's given her... Doing so many evil deeds for Magica has given her this impression that she's inherently a bad person and can't change until she comes across Webby, the first friend that she found on her own, and I think that's why she values her so much as a friend. And Lena, judging by her interactions, I don't think has ever met anyone like that in her life before, who has seen, has, she's shown her flaws as a human being. They call each other human beings in the show. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. <sighs> Fuck, where was I? Right, right. She's shown that she can be a disobedient, unruly child, the exact opposite to Webby, but Webby does see that there's something genuinely good about her, which is something that Lena is not used to, and it leaves her incredibly conflicted. But judging by the fact that she has screwed up in front of Webby so many times, and Webby is so quick to forgive because she sees the good in her, it motivates her to do a lot more good things. But doing those good things come at a price of being abused by Magicka, and in one case, kind of sort of being killed. I don't know if they technically count that in the universe, but I count that as being killed. And when she does come back to life, as great as it is that she's back with Webby and she's making a conscious effort to be a good person, the looming threat of Magicka and the fact that she committed these crimes in her service to begin with leaves her still concerned that she might go back to her usual self. And it isn't until, not just with Webby, but Webby and Violet, and the boys in particular, who have all understood the pain and suffering that she has gone through, understand why she didn't tell them in the first place, even though... I don't know if telling her would have made much of a difference, because Magica is a sorceress and was literally bound to her through the shadow, so I guess telling anyone about it probably wouldn't have helped her all that much. Which, that's the thing, like, there are legit stakes to this. 
Legit stakes that I haven't really seen that many movie shows or character arcs nowadays. The fact that I've gone on and on for minutes about both of these characters without giving that much away, because they're not super complex. They haven't gone through the most dangerous things that I've seen in a kid's show, let alone any show or movie, but their struggles feel relatable. Anyone can identify with feeling isolated from the world, feeling awkward among friends and family your age, feeling as if you've done something so irreparable that nobody will forgive you. These are small but incredibly identifiable character traits that you don't see in entertainment. For starters, I think I'm going to make at least one video diary in this format per week, see how I do off the cuff with answering these questions, how much I can stay focused, and what I can do in order to improve, in, in order to improve upon that. And I did try it a couple times last year, but I wasn't really committed to it. And I realize now the fact that I've gone half an hour like this, while also being able to share a couple minor personal details about myself that aren't in con that aren't consequential to the channel and how I make my content, that I can be a little bit more expressive. And some people can learn a few things about me. In fact, post some questions for me to answer down below, and I will definitely make an effort to do so. And the other thing is, if there's a movie that is opening within the week, and I'm not really excited to see it, I just need to make a video about something else. A video I of a movie I watched last year but didn't, which I'm probably going to do with Babylon, Tar, and Bones and All, and RRR. Do some older movies like The Standoff at Sparrow Creek, a movie that I did a podcast episode of on Spotify that, again, because of supposedly a lack of time and lack of interest is something that I definitely need to get started up again. And that's the other thing. I need to watch more movies. I need to, if the urge comes to watch a movie, put it on, whether it's on your laptop or the TV. If there's a fear that it might not be good, put it on anyways, because if it ends up not being good, nine out of 10 times, it's usually the movie's fault. There's something about it that doesn't hold up anymore. And you know what? Even if you don't end up watching it, that thought will come up in your head eventually. I mean, I feel considerably more calm, which is weird. I make, I've made so many mistakes within this video that I probably shouldn't be, and whenever I'm making a scripted review, my heart tends to be pounding. I get a lot of uh, build up within the throat, which just drives me insane. Even though my mouth is dry, I'm not particularly thirsty, and I'm not nervous at all, so I guess that is a good thing. And I'm not really sure whether or not I should keep making notes, because there's always going to be an urge for me to go back and look at it, or if I should just ask the questions that people would have with a movie, how are the actors, how's the camera work, was there anything you didn't like about it? I should just, maybe I should just type out those questions as I'm recording, like I'm doing right now, and then articulate my thoughts about it as quickly, but as detailed as I possibly can. I'll probably end up writing notes on my way home from the movie theater, assuming I don't have a bag of popcorn or something like that in my hand, which... Most of the time, I get a refill of popcorn just for my parents because they love the popcorn and it's free, so what can I say? And altogether, I just need to be more open and honest about how I feel towards certain movies. If I think a movie focuses more on identity politics more than the actual entertainment value, I'm going to be as crystal clear as I possibly can. I'm going to be polite about it. There are people like Critical Drinker and Nerd Roddick who, while... I don't think it's intentional. Sometimes they do come across a little too mean-spirited and condescending, which, you know, you could chalk it up to being... You could chalk it up to entertainment value within their own videos because just spouting it out isn't always that entertaining. I've seen some people do that and fail tremendously at it, but that's the other thing. I really do need to come up with some actual jokes. Usually when I make people laugh in real life... It's generally by giving this stunted reaction to something stupid and then they and then they laugh. 
which uh, obviously doesn't cater very well into these kinds of videos. I should probably change up the posters within this too. I mean, I really like the look of this and I bought this poster specifically to support the movie. I was thinking of getting a Blu-ray, but um, there were no special features on it and I felt like this was the best I could do. I wanted the... Uh, I wanted the cover on the Blu-ray where he's opening up the uh, gun rack and one of them is missing, but they didn't have that. But I do like this black and white noir look to it. In fact, I think, I know I covered this on a podcast, but I'm probably going to re-watch this and do a review of it because this is genuinely one of the most underrated movies I've seen in years. It's a great detective movie. It's a contained thriller. It's an apolitical movie. It's from... Dallas Sonier, a producer who now makes movies for The Daily Wire, and not gonna lie, I've enjoyed a couple Daily Wire movies because, again, they focus surprisingly on entertainment value more than political messaging. There are no lines about why abortion is wrong, mainly because I, which is good, I don't think abortion is wrong, personally. But, um, yeah. Overall, I just got to broaden my horizons. I need to take every opportunity that I possibly can in order to make any video, let alone one that's good, and hopefully experiment a lot more. Part of why I wanted to do therapeutic reviews was because I wanted to do something that had camera angles, that had aspect ratios, that had some form of style to it. Because one of the great things about Every Frame of Painting and Royal Ocean was that it wasn't just an analysis for the sake of analysis. Royal Ocean, especially with his Photoshop designs, it's just incredible. The fact that it takes months to make seconds worth of footage is just insane. I don't know how he does it. I don't really want to because I don't want to copy off of it. And plus, even with the couple days of work, the couple days I have off of work, I'm not going to be able to pull off what he's doing. The most I can do is use this camera on this laptop to my fullest advantage. With a little movie called Skinamarink coming out this month, I will definitely have something stylistic up my sleeves. Just you wait and see. So yeah, as a lot of you can tell, I'm much more... I sound a lot more articulate and thoughtful during my regular reviews, and that's mainly because I have it all scripted. And, you know, a lot of people can say you had it up here before scripting it, but here's the thing. Once I'm finished typing it, a part of me does think that it's lost, that it's that I've taken it out of my brain and can't put it back in, and that putting it back in is by rehearsing it and then filming it on camera, which, as I said before, depending on how I feel about the movie or about other things, it doesn't always come out the exact way I want it to. So hopefully... This video, along with many others in the future, can be a step forward in order to make better stuff for you guys and in order to, in order for myself to get better. So in any case, thank you guys so much for watching. Whatever questions you want me to answer in future vlogs, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews and be sure to like and subscribe. Happy New Year.